Greetings, everyone. Thank you for coming this afternoon. This is, you cannot hear me? It's on. It's on? Who says it's on? I can hear it. Okay. Greetings, everyone. Thanks for coming. This is our part two of our program to celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month. And this is a collaboration between University of Cincinnati Libraries and the Department of Romance and Arabic Languages and Literatures. I'm Arlene Johnson. I'm the liaison librarian to uh, Romance Languages, Romance and Arabic Languages. And welcome to everyone. And it's my pleasure to introduce Brad Warren, who's the associate dean. A and Associate Dean at University of Cincinnati Libraries. Welcome. Thanks, Arlene. Uh, hopefully I, I can do this a little louder. Uh, so as she said, I'm Brad Warren. I'm the Associate Dean of Library Services here at the University of Cincinnati Libraries. And it's my distinct pleasure to welcome you to our celebration of Hispanic Heritage Month here at UCL. If you, uh, this is uh, the uh, first of the two presentations you've been to, welcome. If you were here earlier, welcome again, and please pardon the duplication of what I'm saying. Uh, but at the same time, we're very happy to be doing this and welcome. This is the fourth year that the UC Libraries have partnered with the Romance and Arabic Languages and Literatures Department to celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month. And I'm especially delighted to welcome you to this year's exciting and tasty programs and by tasty, I mean chocolate. Uh, oh, yeah, somebody's enjoying that already. OK, good. Um, and so while this is only my eighth week uh, here at the UC Libraries, I continue to be deeply impressed and thankful of the high level of academic engagement and quality programming sponsored by the library in various college and departments on campus. And this event is certainly no ex uh, exception. And I want to thank all the members of the Planning Committee for their hard work to bring us this fantastic program today, uh, the second one of two. Uh, from the UC Libraries, it's Michael Alfieri, Olia Hart, Sally Moffat, Melissa Norris, Debbie Tanofsky, Amanda Welter, and our moderator, Arlene Johnson. Uh, from the Romance and Arabic Languages and Literature Department, uh, Professor Kadora, Professor Gutierrez, Dr. Migren Georges, Professor Moreno, and Professor Tomei. Thank you all so much for your efforts to bring this event to us today. Oh, in addition, I apologize. Also, there were two students on the planning group as well, uh, Kendall Smith and Maddie James. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Migren Georges, Department Head of the Romance and Arabic Languages and Literatures Department, who will introduce our speakers. Thank you. Uh, I'm uh, Therese Migren georges the head of the Department of Romance and uh, Arabic uh, Languages and Literatures. Um, as you may know, we have just recently um, been able to change uh, our names. Uh, so it's kind of timely since this morning we had a, a presentation on the Arabic uh, Spice Road. Um, our, and today we have uh, another, uh, this afternoon we have another presentation uh, with Dr. Uh, Maria Paz Moreno. And uh, I hope it gives you a, a sense of the kind of span, the range of classes and programs that we have in, um, in our department. Um, I'm doing a little bit of shameless promotion for, for our department. Uh, there are some flyers uh, next to the, to, the, to the front desk if you're interested. And please also come and talk to, to me or to uh, uh, Dr. Maria Paz Moreno or to anybody else in the, in the department. I also would like to thank um, Langsam Library for hosting these events. Um, this is, I think, the third event um, that we organize uh, jointly, and we're very grateful to be able to use uh, this great uh, space. Um, I just made a list of, there's, there are actually many people who have helped us at Langsam uh, set up these events, so I'm just going to go through my list, and I hope I don't forget anybody. So Arlene Johnson, uh, Debbie Tenovsky, Jay Sinard, Melissa Norris, Amanda Welter, Sally Moffitt, Olga Hart, Michael Alfieri, Brad Warren, and uh, Dennis Gavin. So thank you very much. 
So now it's my, uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce um, my colleague, uh, Professor Maria Paz uh, Moreno. Uh, she's a, a native of Spain, and she received her licenciatura, uh, her BA in Spanish uh, philology from the University of Alicante in Spain, and her PhD in Spanish literature from the Ohio State University. She works on contemporary Spanish poetry, food studies, uh, gastronomy and culinary literature, creative writing poetry, and Spanish uh, women writers. So she also has a very kind of wide range of, uh, of interests. Um, she's the author of several scholarly books and critical editions and eight books, eight books of poetry. I have to, I guess, emphasize the number. Um, among her scholarly books are El Culturalismo and La Poesia de Juan Gil uh, Albert, uh, published in 2000, and the critical edition of uh, Juan Gil Albert, Poesia Completa, um, published in 2004. In the field of culinary uh, literature, so that's kind of her other, her other life, um, Maria Paz has uh, published uh, De la Pagina a Plato, El Libro de Cocino en España, uh, From Page to Play, the Spanish Cookbook, which was published by Trea in 2012. And uh, her, more, her most recent um, publication, uh, titled Madrid, A Culinary History, uh, which was published in the US by Roman and Lowfield in 2017. Uh, and I also want to mention that um, these two books um, have been considered by critics to be groundbreaking studies on the, on the topic. So food studies is a growing field uh, and uh, Maria Paz is definitely um, kind of, I was trying to think of a culinary metaphor, but she's stirring the pot maybe <laughs> uh, in, this, in this field. The uh, title of her presentation today is uh, Tasting Power, The Bittersweet History of Chocolate. Uh, there are some uh, chocolate samples um, over there, so please um, feel free to help yourself. And uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Maria Paz Moreno. to do this without the microphone. If it doesn't work, I'll get the microphone. But I'm one of those people who move their hands a lot, and so it could be potentially dangerous if I am holding a microphone. So let's try this first. I want to say thank you to Therese so much. Thanks so much for the idea of organizing this food week. I think it's working out really well, and I have learned already a lot. Uh, also, thank you to, to the team at the, uh, here at the library who have opened the space to us and have made this possible in this great space. Uh, thank you to all of you who are here. I'm very happy to see that you took the, the bribe of the free chocolate. Did I say free chocolate? Yes, free chocolate. <laughs> Go for it. The, the idea is that you sample that you are enjoying the chocolate while we talk about it. Uh, and you're going to see that there are several, this chocolate in several forms on that table. You have actually chocolate beans. Um, I really, really encourage you to go and try the beans. These are roasted beans. You can eat them. You can eat them whole or you can peel them. It's very, very easy to just, you know, peel, get the shell out and eat them. And eat them. There ha we have nine, several, nine different varieties. Not every chocolate bean is the same. Depending on where in the world it was produced, it's going to taste very different. So I do encourage you, go try them. Uh, now, they're unsweetened. It's uh, as close as you're going to get to pure chocolate to the original way that the, the, the Aztecs were enjoying chocolate, right? So go ahead and try that. You also have chocolate bars. They have been processed. They have been sweetened a little, a little bit, or so more palatable, with also different percentages of cacao. So go ahead, try them, compare. And finally, you have, well, chocolate donuts, right? The greatest uh, contribution of the US to the world, donuts. Uh, and with chocolate, so we have chocolate added to, to pastries. Um, so yeah, I do encourage you to, to you know, it's, it's painful if you're talking about something delicious and you can't taste it. So go ahead and go for it. So yes, we're going to be talking about um, chocolate, the good and the bad and the ugly, maybe. Uh, and I'm going to give you a little bit of the idea of what you're in for. So if you don't like it, you're still on time, you can leave. But it's going to be a story of love, yes, power, deceit, also exploitation, uh, more or less in four parts. The first one we'll be talking about chocolate in ancient Mesoamerica, what it was, how, how was it produced, how was it consumed, what did it mean for the peoples of Mesoamerica mm -hmm. before the Europeans arrived there and messed everything up. Um, the second part, we'll be talking about the discovery of, of, of the new world 
and the discovery of chocolate. I always I always write discovery and the word discovery in quotation marks because it's uh, kind of ironic to think that uh, one continent discovers another continent that's full of people that have been living there for a long time. <laughs> so this idea that the Europeans discovered the new world, right, is definitely the Eurocentric vision, which is you know predominantly how we look at things. Uh, but you know it's, it's good to be aware of, of that uh, bias. Mm -hmm. Ah, uh, the love affair continues. Yes, to this day, I believe we're all pretty much in love with chocolate. We'll see why. We'll see what it means for us and and and, uh, and, and how how it, how it manifests itself in in contemporary culture. And finally, a bit of a reality check: How is chocolate produced uh, nowadays? How? What are the challenges of of the industrial the industry uh, when it comes to producing chocolate at a massive scale? We'll start with uh, chocolate in Mesoamerica when the Europeans first arrived. It was being produced, uh, the Mayas uh, had been drinking chocolate for centuries, the Aztecs uh, took it or learned it from the Mayas. And uh, so it was really produced in this tropical region where is now Mexico, right? So uh, the part of Tabasco here <coughs> near uh, Yucatan Peninsula. Oh, wait, I have a pointer. Right, <laughs> yes, okay. So, <laughs> so Tabasco is still, today you can have chocolate from Tabasco. So they're still growing chocolate there, or cacao there. The region of Guatemala, uh, Belize, Honduras, uh, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, right? So the darker the color is the, the highest uh, the production of chocolate. So this is the areas where it have been cultivated for centuries. In, uh, the Mayas, the Aztecs, they had chocolate in very high esteem. It was a very, very special thing. It was a, a thing that was hard to, uh, hard to produce. It's very labor intensive. The trees are a little picky on where they grow and how they, you know, when they decide to bear fruit. So it was very much something that they appreciated a lot. Um, incidentally, if you want to see a real chocolate tree, here, it's not, we, we don't live in the tropics, unfortunately, but you can go to the Crown Conservatory and they have beautiful chocolate trees there that usually have you know, a few pots, so you can see the real thing, uh, you know, as close as it gets. So the name that uh, Linneos give to, to the cacao tree is Theobroma cacao. Theobroma coming from the Greek Theo God and Broma food, so food of the gods. This is he was recognizing the importance that he had for the peoples of Mesoamerica. It was considered a sacred food, a drink, I should say. Uh, nowadays, we eat chocolate in solid form most of the time, but back then, and for a couple of centuries, yeah, a couple of centuries, it was a drink. Uh, we have evidence of the importance of chocolate for the, the Mayas, the Aztecs, in some of the codices, uh, in some of the engravings, and also in the many artifacts that have survived. Uh, ceramics, these are vessels for, for the drink. Um, we know that it was used to cement uh, relationships with other, with other groups, um, alliances, it was used in marriages, it was used to celebrate the new year. So it was used in very special occasions. Uh, it was also um, a drink for the elite. Not everybody could have chocolate. <coughs> the elite, uh, the best warriors were allowed to drink chocolate. Uh, the <coughs> ruler, so it really was something very special that it had a profound religious uh, meaning, a ritual meaning. It was something very, very special and very uh, unique. In some burials, uh, we have they have found uh, some of these um, some of these um, pots that were that were used to drink chocolate, and uh, it definitely you can see that it was very, very important to them. One thing that's very interesting is that chocolate is always represented with this stuff on the top. So chocolate was supposed to be foamy. It had this foam on top. And in some parts of Mexico, they're still preparing it that way. It's supposed to have this foam, and that was considered the best part of the drink. Mm -hmm. uh, here are a couple of vases. Uh, this is from, a, from an exhibit in Spain a couple years ago. I took this picture. So there are some Mayan, Mayan vases where you can see, well, the, the chocolate is here. I think this is the symbol, the name for chocolate. Um, and some of these vessels, uh, the vases, as you can see, they're very sophisticated, very delicate. So it really gives us an idea of how important this was. Um, I like to show this uh, to my students, usually in, in, in the class that I teach on food and culture, incidentally, parenthesis. This uh, talk is also part of what, uh, what we talk about in the, in the class that I teach in the spring, uh, Food and Culture of Spain. It's a 3,000 level uh, Spanish class, so if you're interested in what you hear uh, today, think about and consider signing up for a class. But anyway, I like to teach this to my, to show this to my students 
because it really um, shows that exchange from the biological standpoint that took place between the old world and the new world uh, when the Europeans first arrived, right? Uh, so we have a number of products that made it to the old world, to Europe. We have uh, peppers, pineapple, cacao, of course, vanilla, tomatoes, potatoes. Can you imagine if you can picture Italian food without tomatoes? Uh, Asian food without spicy chili peppers? Uh, Spanish food without potatoes, for that matter? This was the way it was uh, before the 16th century. So things have changed quite a bit, right, over there. Also, things have changed quite a bit here, right? All these uh, livestock, all these fruits made it to the new world, as did a number of awful diseases like smallpox, influenza, typhus, all these that uh, greatly decimated the, the native population. So all these things happened with this so-called Colombian exchange, right? This idea. And yes, we're talking today about cacao as one of the major, um, the most popular, I guess, most successful perhaps crops that came from, from the New World, right? So the first time that a Europeans ever encountered cacao, it is believed to have been Christopher Columbus and his son, Hernando Colon, who was 14 at the time when he accompanied his father on a hill, which was Columbus's fourth voyage to the New World. Um, um, Apparently they were off the coast of Honduras, if I'm not mistaken, and they saw a, a canoe uh, of Mayans uh, transporting a number of goods, and among them there were these almonds. Well, they thought they were almonds because Columbus had never seen uh, cocoa beans, so they thought they were almonds. They looked like almonds. I don't know if you notice the beans over there. They look like they could be almonds. So years later, his son in his diaries was remembering that that moment, and he was describing what, what he saw, right? Many of the almonds, which the Indians of New Spain use as currency, which is very interesting, and these the Indians in the canoe valued greatly, for I noticed that when they were brought aboard with the other goods and some fell to the floor, all the Indians stood to pick them up as if they had lost an eye, or right? something very valuable. So this idea that um, the seeds were used as currency, it's also something that we've seen, that we see often in the literature. Uh, in fact, for during some, well, about 200 years, basically, uh, the Spaniards, when they arrived to what is now Mexico and they brought with them the Spanish currency, the silver coins, um, the natives were using uh, cacao beans as currency. And at the beginning, they didn't accept uh, these coins because they thought that what can you make with a piece of, what can, what can you do with a piece of silver? It's useless. With a seed, you can do something, right? You can eat it, you can make something. So for them, it was actually more valuable. So um, Spanish uh, coins and, and seeds uh, existed alongside as, as currency for a number of years. Eventually, they disappeared as, as currency and only the, the Spanish uh, money uh, prevailed. Right? But this is the first <coughs> instance that we have uh, of, of the encounter of Cacao, by Europeans. We also have a testimony of Bernal Diaz del Castillo. Bernal Diaz del Castillo was a soldier that accompanied Hernán Cortés during this uh, was the conquest of Tenochtitlan, which is now Mexico City. And he he was um, in his writings. He um, recounts these uh, banquets that were given for Moctezuma, the Aztec emperor. And he says, and I quote, "They will bring several cups made of fine gold." with a certain drink made from the same cacao that they said was good for having relations with women. This is an interesting, um, an interesting idea. It's perhaps the origin of that myth that uh, chocolate is an aphrodisiac, right? Maybe this is the, the, I think this is the first mention of that idea. What I saw was that they brought more than 50 big jars filled with frothy cacao, and he would drink from it. So here we have, again, how in special banquets, special situations, this drink was, was, was prepared. Now, the way to get it to be frothy, they would um, pour it from uh, one container to another, kind of like different heights, so that it would get all full. And that was, as I said, very appreciated. Uh, we also have the testimony of Fernand Cortez himself. He also wrote, uh, he was talking about these seeds, and he said again, right, a fruit similar to almonds, because for the Europeans, that was their only reference. Hmm? They use it as currency all over this land. With it, they purchase everything they need in the markets and everywhere else. So what Hernán Cortés noticed was that, um, uh, well, his men, when they drank this drink that the Aztecs were drinking, they could go on for entire days without any food. They had energy. They were 
they could just go on without really needing any more food. The problem was that uh, for the Europeans, the way the chocolate was prepared by the Aztecs was considered awful, terrible. They thought it tasted awful, it had no sugar, it was very bitter, it was brown, it was thick because it had been thickened with uh, corn, with ground corn. I had sometimes chili peppers, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it had a little bit of achiote, which would make your lips uh, red, your teeth red. So they thought it was disgusting, the mm -hmm. most disgusting thing you could try. However, they realized, and Hernan Cortez you know, realized that it was useful, that there was something to this. We know that um, cacao contains theobromine. Theobromine uh, is um, an alkaloid that it's, um, what do I want to say, uh, takes, um, affects the nervous system, so it's a stimulant, right? A little bit like coffee. So they, they said, we have to figure out how to be able to drink this. They started trying different things, vanilla, different things, and finally sugar, right? So once they added sugar, the Europeans said, we can do this, definitely, this is much better. <laughs> now, we know this thing, let's change it to our palate, right? And they did, they started adding sugar, and um, the drink definitely became uh, the darling of, of um, you know, the high class in Europe. So really, the history of chocolate and sugar go hand in hand. Uh, and by that I mean that the plantations of, of uh, cacao became ubiquitous all over in the tropics, the tropics in the New World, but so did the, the sugar cane plantations that were mostly exploited by the, the, the Portuguese. Uh, the Portuguese had them in uh, Madeira, they had them in Brazil, and they would import uh, African slaves to work on these plantations. Um, the, the cocoa plantations, uh, the workers were mostly, were usually the native peoples, right? Um, the indigenous peoples of America, of Latin America, Central America, and they were often exploited by uh, religious orders, such as the Jesuits. The Jesuits were very successful, they became very wealthy, very powerful, and they ran several, many of these plantations. Which, uh, the fact that several religious orders um, run and, and exploit this, this plantation really speaks also to the power of re religion as a tool to, to dominate the, the conquered subjects, right? Uh, the, so religious <coughs> conversion was the first step to, to gain control over the, the subject of the new lands, and then they would be the ones working on those plantations. So who benefited from this trade? Well, definitely the Spanish crown and, and the Catholic Church as well, right? And mostly the, the um, Jesuits. So um, all the, the ships that arrived from the Indies, or the New World, to Spain, they were arrived to the port of Cadiz uh, and, and a load all the, all the cargo. Um, because chocolate became so, so popular, and uh, it was, there was such a craze for this, for this new drink, a lot of um, you know, picaresque situations took place, and there's a very interesting anecdote that I've heard referred so many times that I'm going to repeat it here. I hope it's true, I don't know. But uh, I think it's a really, really telling story. Uh, supposedly in 1701, um, a ship arrived to the port of Cadiz um, with a big cargo, several crates full of uh, what they were supposed to be chocolate, chocolate bars, let's say. And it was destined for the Compañía de Jesús, or the Jesuits. Uh, however, when the workers trying to uh, unload these boxes, they realized they, they were so heavy they could barely move them. So they decided to open the crates, and when they looked, these chocolate bars, were they really had a very thin layer of chocolate, but they were actually gold bars, bars of gold, uh, that the Jesuits were trying to smuggle in to, to bring into, into Spain without mm, telling the crown, because by law, every, all the gold that came from the Indies belonged to the Spanish crown. Mm -hmm. So they were caught in their little, um, you know, in their little attempt, and um, legend goes that uh, the chocolate was given to the workers and the, the uh, gold was given to the king. Uh, meanwhile, in Europe, so in the, in the New World, we had all the slaves, we had uh, the Indians being exploited, producing this, this precious substance. Meanwhile, in Europe, people were falling in love with this drink. It became a very fashionable thing to, to consume. It was a sign of status, how much money you had, you, you could show it off by drinking chocolate. Not only that, there were a lot of other things that came with chocolate to prepare it, to serve it. You had fine china. You had all these different um, tablecloths, silver spoons, and all these things that, could, uh, that would allow you to show uh, how wealthy you were. <coughs> so people were tasting chocolate, they were tasting power. They were tasting um, the product of the colonial powers, right? Exploiting these, 
this new world. It was this exotic dream. Uh, I had a lot of connotations in that sense. So uh, if you were really wealthy, you would do things like this, you know, dress in your best clothes, and have a painter come and paint a portrait of you um, showing you know, how you drink chocolate. Mm -hmm. so you're very sophisticated. Um, here's another example. Um, here's an interesting thing that is said to be very com commonly used. It's called a molinillo. So this molinillo is like a wooden uh, stick with, um, it's hard to describe, but a wooden piece here at the end that you would shake with your hands to create the foam, mm -hmm. to make the, the chocolate a bit frothy. And then you would serve it in this uh, molinillo as well, right? So it would also be served for the Europeans with uh, these nice pastries, sweet pastries, and very nice uh, ceramic mm -hmm. cups and saucers and all kinds of things. Uh, again, to show, to show wealth, to show status. Uh, and it became you know, quite a common motif in, in many paintings at the time. Mm -hmm. Now, um, because it became so popular, it, uh, people were drinking in church, people were drinking it at all hours of the day, chocolate was the thing to do all the time, uh, the Catholic Church started getting a little nervous, right? And so did the scientific community. Uh, the church was wondering if it was a sin somehow because it made people feel really good and everybody was you know, just really so much in love with the thing, is this really a sin? And also, does it break the fast? More importantly, does it break the fast? There are some times where you're not allowed to eat, right? Uh, and so is chocolate a food? Is it a drink? Is it a medicine? Many doctors were recommending chocolate as a cure for pretty much everything. Um, from, I don't know, gout to you name it, right? To the flu. Uh, some doctors also repeated this idea that it actually excited the sexual appetite. Mm -hmm. So it goes again the idea of it being aphrodisiac. So there were a lot of debates during the 17th, 16th, 17th century about whether it was allowed, you know, you could eat it or not, and whether it was good for you or bad for you. Finally, the church, after many meetings and debates and discussions, they decided that it was okay, that it did not break the fast, so chocolate just, you know, became even more, more popular. If, yeah, if you need any help, right? Um, so yes, what we have is, for example, portraying these tiles from a museum in, in Valencia, in Spain, this chocolatada, or chocolate party, a party for chocolate for everybody took place in the street. Here you can actually see the molinillo at work. So he's uh, with his hands wrapping the, the molinillo to create the, the foam, mm -hmm. and then it's on a yeah, on the fire here, and then it, got, it gets uh, served on the on the cups, right? And, uh, Part of this. So it became part of this popular, you know, popular celebration. Uh, initially, chocolate was only for the rich, for the wealthy. Again, it was a sign of status. Eventually, it became a lot more accessible for everybody, and it became a lot more you know, yeah, popular. Everybody from every class could, could enjoy. Mm -hmm. um, like today, I guess, right? Uh, so let's talk about chocolate today. If you remember the map that we saw at the beginning, um, it was only produced in, this, you know, in the tropics in this area of uh, Central America. Nowadays, chocolate is uh, still only produced in this belt uh, with you know, 20, yeah, 20 degrees of the equator because that's the only place where it really grows. But uh, not only in Central America. Now we have West Africa, actually is the biggest producer of chocolate in the world. Places like uh, Cote d'Ivoire or Ivory Coast in Ghana produce the majority of the chocolate that we eat um, anywhere in the world. Uh, it's hard to see the, the figures here, but so darker, the darker the color, the highest the production, right? Uh, Indonesia as well, and yeah, Brazil, and of course still Central America, there's all this, um, still there's production, very much smaller scale. The biggest scale takes place in, in um, Ivory Coast and um, Ivory Coast and in Ghana. We'll talk about the, the progress of that, of that entails. But uh, so how to produce cacao, how do you produce cacao? As I said before, it was very um, special for the Aztecs because it was very hard to get. Um, the trees grow only within 20, 15 to 20 uh, degrees of the equator. They really require the tropical environments. That's why here you have to go to the Crown Conservatory, right? You're not going to grow in the, in the campus, even if you try. Mm -hmm. The ideal climate. <coughs> They like it hot, they like it rainy, they like it tropical. Uh, temperature cannot fall below uh, 60 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? They need shade, they cannot take direct sun, so they, they grow in the understory. Mm -hmm. So they're very peculiar trees. They, yeah, they, yeah, they're moving, right, in that sense. 
Uh, they're very prone to disease, um, which is also the reason why um, I believe the original uh, varieties of trees that the Aztecs were, were growing, cultivating, no longer exist. Uh, they became extinct because of disease, and now when we have other varieties, they're a little bit more resistant. Now, if you want to try the chocolate that is the closest, <coughs> the closest to what the Aztecs were, were drinking, go for the Criollo variety. Criollo variety, Trinitario, they're both close. Uh, and they have a very delicate flavor. Uh, some of the chocolates over there, I think there's one or two that are a mix of criollo and trinitario. Um, so I would encourage you to try them. The Forastero, the Arriba varieties are more resistant, but they're a little bit less delicate, a little bit rougher on the palate. Of course, once you have uh, that chocolate processed into you know, your regular supermarket chocolate bar, uh, they've been added sugar, they've been added uh, so many things and, and that you can't really taste. The, the, the cocoa and the cacao so much. But if you go for the chocolate itself, for the cacao in, in, in your state, you can really tell the difference. Um, so to produce uh, one of those beautiful bars that we can get here in campus by pushing a button on a vending machine, right, it takes a lot of work. First, you have to grow the, the tree, wait until, right, you have the harvest. Harvesting, getting the beans out, fermenting them, drying them, roasting them and then grind them, and once you have done that, you have a paste that you can do something with, right? So it does take a lot of work and it's a long, a long process. Some figures about, about cacao today. Mm -hmm. uh, about five million farmers in the world, um, around the world, work uh, growing cacao. Mm -hmm. And the number of people who depend on, on cacao for their livelihood is about 40 to 50 million estimated. The cacao production annually, the latest figure for 2017 is 4.7 million tons, which is a lot, mm -hmm. I think. Now, the increase, uh, I mean, the demand for, for cacao has been increasing every year for the past 100 years. We just cannot get enough of this wonderful <coughs> stuff, right? Uh, so we demand more and more. So who is growing this for us? Uh, West Africa, 68% of the world's was cacao. So chances are if you're buying a Hershey's bar, if you're buying one of those, uh, you know, mass-produced or mass-produced uh, chocolate, it's going to come from West Africa. Um, the more gourmet uh, type chocolates uh, are usually grown in Central America, uh, usually a smaller production, smaller plots, uh, different varieties, it tends to be a little um, fine in that sense. Mm -hmm. And more expensive too. Um, Asia, yes, uh, Central America, as I mentioned, all within 20 years of the equator. So the higher pro highest producer is by far Ivory Coast, with about 38% of the world's production, which is a lot for one, one country. Uh, a tree that uh, takes about three to five years before it produces its first uh, beans, and then they live for about 10 years, maybe a little longer, depending on the, on the variety. So, you know, it's, it, again, it's difficult to, to grow this, this product. So who is eating all that chocolate? We have uh, West Africa growing <laughs> chocolate like crazy. Who is eating it? Uh, well, apparently the Germans have a never-ending <laughs> appetite for it. <laughs> uh, so do the people in Belgium, Switzerland, United Kingdom. So the US is up here, not bad, right? Uh, we're there, we're there, we consume a lot. Uh, Halloween, uh, Valentine's Day, uh, Christmas, every day, right? Mondays, I don't know. Uh, we eat chocolate all the time, apparently, so yes. So if you notice, there's a big difference between who is producing this and who is consuming this, right? Uh, if we think back in colonial times, so we had uh, the, the countries that were being exploited in that sense by the, the powerful colonial powers, right? Colonial uh, countries. And then nowadays we have sort of a similar situation. We have poor countries uh, in West Africa uh, producing this luxury item, this um, something of an indulgence. For, for people in, in rich countries, in wealthy countries. Mm -hmm. Now, why do we love chocolate so much? We are still very much in love with chocolate, um, just as the Europeans were in love, just as the, the Maya elite was in love with it. Um, I thought I would show a little clip, a short clip from this movie, Chocolat. Anybody has seen this movie? Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty good movie. So just a short clip that speaks a little bit about our infatuation with this, with this product, and also what it, what it evokes in us, right? Chocolate has this myth, uh, this, this aura, of being something that evokes um, an emotional response, right? Uh, it makes us feel good, it makes us happy, it uh, suggests
repressed ideas of love, maybe passion, maybe repressed sensuality, things like that. There's a lot of that um, around chocolate. So let me see if it still works. Should work. The paper triangle must be here. Tiny hand of chili pepper to play against the sweetness. That would be adventurous. What do you see? I see teeth. I see blood. And the skull. Very dark, bitter chocolate. That's your favorite. Uh, which will have to wait five weeks more. Lent. Thank you. We must run along. It's been nice to meet you. My pleasure. How much are those chili things, please? Four fifteen bucks. Can you put a ribbon on it? Mm-hmm. Then I can pretend that for my husband. Mm -hmm. Of course. Josephine Musica. She wants us to her own tune. And these are for your husband. And we find coconuts from Guatemala to waken passion. <laughs> You've obviously never met my husband. Obviously, never tried these. <laughs> <laughs> We have this idea, right, of the, the, the passion, the exoticism, all these associations that have to do with how we feel about chocolate. So yes, uh, think about Valentine's Day, right? What happens on Valentine's Day? We love somebody, therefore we get them chocolate. Um, definitely have this association, association right? Uh, love and chocolate, they come together. Here's a wonderful spa, right, where you can get chocolate all over your face, and she it feels very good, right? So chocolate is connected to well-being. It has this, it, it really evokes this emotional response in us that's, that's very positive, right? A bit idealized, if, if you will. There's a TV commercial playing these days. I'm, I'm not sure what brand it is. There's a teenage daughter who locks herself up in her room, and she's very upset, and the mom is sitting outside, and she's like a piece of chocolate under the door. Have you seen this? I know what brand it is. And so and then she comes out and you know chocolate makes everything better. So the mother and the daughter are bonding over the, the chocolate, right? So again, this 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 emotional connection. So that um, those feelings of, of happiness and you know this idea of chocolate equals love, uh, it's a bit of a stark contrast with the reality of cacao plantations in some parts of the world. Uh, some parts of the world. Uh, the problem is ma happens mainly in, in Ivory Coast and in Ghana where these massive plantations um, are so huge and, they're, and the, the demand is so high that they have really opened the door for, for human rights violations. There's a lot of um, forced uh, child labor, so child um, slaves, 
uh, we have uh, human trafficking, we have a big, big problem. And the big companies such as you know, your Mars, your oh, Nestle, this, the companies they know did exist, this exists. <coughs> In recent years, there's been more and more reports about this. Uh, a number of campaigns, you know, to shame them into doing something, and finally they are, seems like they're starting to do something to try to eradicate the, these problems, but really this is, uh, this happens really every day uh, in, in places like West Africa and Ghana. It is estimated that between one and two in every ten children in cocoa growing communities is, is, is estimated to be engaged in some form of child labor. Uh, this is a documentary, Dark Side of Chocolate, that uh, talks about this, this situation. Uh, these children, they are often snatched from their countries, they're, they're taken, um, they're beaten if they try to escape, they are, they're effectively slaves, right? They get paid nothing or close to nothing, uh, they work in horrible conditions. So, you know, it is a big problem, and uh, we don't know about it, don't want to know about it, but it's, 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 yeah, it's a problem that we do. And that uh, we as consumers can also, you know, make uh, make decisions to, to encourage the industry to, to help with this, to put an end to this practice. Some other figures and statistics, right? 1.8 million is the estimated number of children who work in chocolate production in West Africa, mostly Ivory Coast and Ghana, um, which supply, as we said before, about two thirds of the world's chocolate. Uh, the average cocoa farmer receives less than 5% of the price of a chocolate bar. We go to the store, we buy a chocolate bar, what, $6, uh, 7 I don't know, it's ridiculously expensive sometimes. Well, the farmer gets very, very little from that. Uh, so what can we do? We can buy fair trade chocolate. Mm -hmm. Some other, some companies uh, do have uh, better practices. Uh, the average cocoa farmer in West Africa makes less than $2 a day. Mm -hmm. Uh, 10,000 is the estimated number of child laborers in chocolate production who are victims of some form of slavery. And finally, 30% of the Mars, Nestle, Mondelez collectively purchase more than 30% of the world's cocoa. So there's big players, there are big players in the field, and they should have the power to do something. Mm -hmm. Some conclusions, I wanted to wrap this up so nobody falls asleep, and also we have time for questions or comments, right? I always like to see what uh, people, what kind of connections people are making, right? This is what I, I've been presenting. Um, we have been talking about how the history of chocolate, how it has unfolded, and it really does, it's a very good metaphor uh, to represent the relationship, the difficult relationship between Europe, the old world, the new world, um, uh, countries with power and countries that are, you know, uh, the subject of colonialism, uh, oppression, uh, etc. Uh, we have uh, also this, this, this power balance, right, between the affluent countries and the developing world, right, in today's economy. Chocolate, as we saw at the very beginning, had a very profound transcendental meaning for the Aztecs and the Mayas. It was a religious, something they used in religious ceremonies. Uh, we had a, a, it was a very, very special thing. It had a, a profound meaning. For the Europeans, it became mostly a symbol of status. For us today, it has become associated in a more superficial manner, I would say, with love, with sensuality. Um, and we also have this idea that it's an aphrodisiac, right? So it's, it's always associated with that. Modern marketing has very conveniently perpetuated this idea that, that love, that, that chocolate is aphrodisiac, right? And so we need to cannot go on Valentine's Day and not, not have chocolate, or give chocolate. Also that pre-Columbian chocolate it was very different to, from what we eat today. Uh, it was a drink for them. For us, we mostly eat it in the form of bars, uh, something that didn't happen until the 19th century when they figured out how to mix it with milk, with sugar, and still uh, make a solid bar. Um, incidentally, I think uh, cacao is the only natural fat that melts at body temperature. And I think that's why it's supposed to be so pleasant for us, right, to, to eat it because it has this very nice uh, feel, right? Um, so yes, um, today it's not a rare treat. It's a commodity. It's mass produced for us to enjoy. And all we have to do is put in a dollar in a machine and push a button. And so, you know, it has lost some of the, some of the um, elements that made it very special uh, initially. 
Um, the reality too, many poor countries uh, are dependent, right, economically dependent on cacao for their survival. Human trafficking, child labor, our realities, our challenges, things that need to be um, addressed. Uh, the good news is that there are some initiatives to, to, to change this. The World Cocoa Foundation and other nonprofits, such as the, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, are working towards a better, better practices in the industry, an industry that gives farmers a fair, fair price for their work, that human rights are respected, that child labor is ended, and that communities that grow cocoa can have a, a dignified life. And I just want to say thank you. If anybody has questions or comments, or if you want to add something, please do. Is there anywhere in Cincinnati you can go to taste a recipe that's older, like the one you described? Not that I know of. Not that I know of. No. Um, um, I think there are a number of people in Cincinnati making chocolate, but uh, it's also very processed. I think I mean, they make some, you know, some are good quality, but I don't think any of them do anything remotely tra traditional in that sense, no. Mm -hmm. What happened to the phone? Oh, yes. Uh, well, it went away, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. I guess what we have some time, in, well, actually, Somebody was telling me, Alberto, he's not, he's not here today, but he was saying in Mexico, in some parts of Mexico, it's still pretty traditional to drink this chocolate drink, and it's supposed to be frothy. Mm -hmm. So in some parts of Mexico, they still drink it, you know, closer to what it was uh, centuries ago with the froth, froth on top, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So <clears throat> you talked about the, um, the, uh, the value of the, of the bean, the cacao bean. Um, and uh, how it was used for trading and for mm -hmm. sort of like currency, right? Mm -hmm. So, and also the, the, the its religious meaning and uh, the sacred sort of like um, uh, significance. So, have you considered making any kind of connection or studying other um, other highly valuable uh, products that people used to trade with or use for religious? Um, Purposes like the co the, the coca leaf or the, or salt or silk or or you know other precious uh, matter. Yes, right. I have not looked into that, but uh, I think that would be a very interesting study. Yes, yes, um, yeah. And I think you can obviously everybody ha trade started like that, right? Because you had this, you, yeah, I had that, and then that's how trade started. Uh, Seashells, I, I believe, were pretty actually pretty important. You know, Ago. So yeah, I haven't studied that, but I'm sure there's a lot that you can. Yeah, because I was thinking of the coca leaf mm -hmm. in the entire yeah. world, which had, you know, mm -hmm. same values attached to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, that's a very different study. And also, I want to say that if you drink cola cow uh -huh. cold with milk, and if you take one of those IKEA um, little, you know, little <coughs> things, it so gets frothy. Yes. <laughs> yes. So now that is cocoa powder, which is actually the cacao. They extract the fat first and they dry as cocoa powder. It's a different product and it behaves differently. But yes, yeah, you can still get some, yeah, frothy chocolate somehow. Yeah. There was a hand over there. Yes. Yeah. I was wondering if you knew of any other like health effects or health benefits that the beans or company in general gives you. Uh, it depends who you ask. Some people say that yes, you know, it's good for your skin. It's good for I don't know kinds of things. Uh, the cocoa butter that also comes from there from the, from the fruit uh, is used very good for your lips, right? And as for hand cream and things like that. So the butter has a lot of uh, nice properties. Um, as far as I know, chocolate is nutritious. It's uh, you know it's um, it's slightly yeah it's slightly um, it's a little bit like coffee but less potent. Um, that's all I know. I don't, I'm not a dietitian, so I don't know a lot more about other properties. But it would be interesting to know if there's other nutritional properties. Yeah. Ah, yes. I think I, I, I was uh, telling you, or we were talking about the fact that uh, I, I kind of use uh, that in my, uh, in my classes about African uh, literature. Mm -hmm. Cultures because um, in uh, Côte d'Ivoire, I think uh, where they, as you explained, they you know produce so much cocoa to you know to be sold, 
uh, I think it's only like uh, maybe three years ago that they finally opened, that someone opened a chocolaterie, you know, in Abidjan. Uh, yes. And so it's like the whole irony is that they, they, yes. they produce so much, you know, they kind of like uh, raw material, but they really don't, they don't get to eat it. I mean, mm -hmm. they, it's just too expensive and they yes. don't have the means to really process it. And so I remember seeing this kind of like little documentary report on the mm -hmm. fact that, and I don't know what the status of that is, but it was kind of like a big event that right. you know people were actually selling <laughs> yeah. chocolates in a, in a sh in a sh in a in a store you yeah. know, in Abidjan, which is it really kind of illustrates you know the the, the terrible you know irony. Of right. What you yeah, everybody works on this industry, but it all gets uh, exported, right? Something similar, a different scale happens, for example, with the coffee in Costa Rica. Costa Rica produces fantastic coffee. It doesn't stay in Costa Rica. The best coffee gets exported, right? Because they, you get more money that way. So, I mean, it, open, it often happens in, in, in these countries. There are big producers of something that they don't get to enjoy, right? Because, they, yeah, it's a very different uh, society, and they don't, yeah, like I said, they don't have the means to process it. They just, yeah. And it is ironic, yeah. Thank you. Well, thanks to all for coming. Uh, two quick things. If you haven't done so already on your way out, if you could sign the sign-in sheets, that would help us on the library side of things. And then also we have a very nice book display towards the front of the library near the desk. So if you haven't had a look at that, please do. Um, thanks to Sally and Debbie and the students um, in their unit for putting that together. And a final thank you to Professor Moreno. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. And don't forget the chocolate. If there's any chocolate in there, go for it. <laughs> so, I'm going, um,